Hi, welcome to our channel of IGNU Audiobooks, Indira Gandhi National Open University, School of Health Sciences, SOHS, Diploma Programs, Diploma in Critical Care Nursing, DCCN, BNS 03 to Nursing Management in Critical Care Conditions, Block 1 Care of Critically Ill Patients with Problems of Gastrointestinal System, Unit to Acute Point Intestinal Obstruction, Perforative Peritonitis, Intra-Abdominal Compartment, Syndrome, 2.0 Objectives. After completing this unit, you will be able to times enumerate the various etiological factors in acute intestinal obstruction, perforative peritonitis and intra-abdominal compartment syndrome, times explain the pathophysiological changes in intestinal obstruction. Perforative peritonitis and intra-abdominal compartment syndrome identify the various signs and symptoms in a patient with acute intestinal obstruction, perforative peritonitis and intra-abdominal compartment syndrome, times appreciate your role in different diagnostic tests to identify the cause of intestinal obstruction, perforative peritonitis and intra-abdominal compartment syndrome, times identify and describe your role as tilde nurse in the prevention, care and management of intestinal obstruction, perforative peritonitis and intra-abdominal compartment syndrome, and times assist the patient in preventing the potential complications of acute intestinal obstruction, perforative peritonitis and intra-abdominal compartment syndrome. 2.1 Introduction Acute intestinal obstruction, perforative peritonitis and intra-abdominal compartment syndrome are some of the most common emergencies in critical care units. As a critical care nurse working in critical care units, you should be able to identify the impending signs and symptoms of these emergencies and prevent the life-threatening complications in the patients by your accurate observations and timely interventions. In this unit we shall discuss about acute intestinal obstruction, perforative peritonitis and intra-abdominal compartment syndrome. 2.2 Acute Intestinal Obstruction, we shall discuss about definition, etiology diagnostic assessment, pathophysiology, clinical manifestation, therapeutic and nursing management of acute intestinal obstruction in the following subsections, 2.2.1 Definition, partial or complete impairment of the forward flow of intestinal contents is known as intestinal obstruction. It is the failure of intestinal contents to move through the bowel lumen. Obstruction of large bowel occurs much less frequently than small bowel obstruction. 2.2.2 Etiological factors The main etiological factors are I. Mechanical obstruction A mechanical bowel obstruction is something that decreases the diameter of the bowel's opening from either the inside or outside. It physically blocks the passage and thereby movement of intestinal. Contents through the intestines resulting into distension and accumulation of fluids and gas. Possible mechanical obstructions could be due to problems outside the intestine, within intestine and in the intestinal lumen as given below FIC 2.1 dot times strangulation by bands or adhesions or through apertures times volvulus twisting of bowel on its mesentery dot times impaction of foric tilde bodies including gallstones, times acute intersections, telescoping of one segment of bowel into another, dot, times neoplasms, times hernias, times strictures, times fecal impaction, FIC 2.1, intestinal obstruction due to mechanical obstruction, 2, neurogenic or adenamic obstruction, paralytic ileus I. E, decreased, Impulses to bowel for propulsive movements interference with the nerve supply to the intestine resulting in the decrease or absence of peristalsis. The causes can be as follows, times inflammatory reactions, acute pancreatitis, appendicitis, comma, times electrolyte abnormalities, especially hypokalemia, comma, times lumbar spinal fractures or spinal cord injury, times abdominal surgery, times shock. Three. Vascular obstruction, interference or the impaired blood supply to a portion of the intestines resulting in ischemia and gangrene of the bowel. It is due to following times clot, thrombosis, times compression of the vessel 
times mesenteric artery occlusion, times mesenteric vein thrombosis, times atherosclerosis, 2.2.3 pathophysiological changes when the bowel is obstructed, ingested fluids and food, digestive secretions, and gas accumulate above the obstruction. Fine proximal bowel distends and the distal segment collapses. The normal secretory and absorptive functions of point the mucosa are depressed and the bowel wall becomes edematous and congested. Normally 7-8 liters of electrolyte-rich fluid is secreted by the bowel and most of it is reabsorbed. Increased pressure within the bowel causes a decrease in the absorption ability of the bowel which increases the fluid retention still further. Soon the increased intraluminal pressure causes a reduction in the venous return which increases the venous pressure. This in turn increases the capillary permeability and allows plasma to extravagate into the bowel lumen and into the peritoneal cavity. The bowel wall also becomes permeable to bacteria and bowel organisms enter the peritoneal cavity. The retention of fluids in the bowel and peritoneal cavity can lead to a severe reduction in the circulating blood volume and can result in hypotension and hypovolemic shock. Strangulating obstruction is obstruction with compromised blood flow. It occurs in nearly 25% of patients with small bowel obstruction. It is usually associated with hernia, volvulus, and intersusceptions. Strangulating obstruction can progress to infarction and gangrene in as little as 6 hours. Venous obstruction occurs first, followed by arterial occlusion, resulting in rapid ischemia of the bowel wall. The ischemic bowel becomes edematous and infarcts, leading to gangrene and perforation. In large bowel obstruction, strangulation is rare, except with volvulus. 2.2.4 Clinical Manifestations We shall discuss above clinical manifestation under two categories, as given below. I. Related to small bowel obstruction, symptoms occur soon after the onset times epigastric or umbilical abdominal cramping. The patient with a small bowel obstruction presents with a pain that is colicky and intermittent. The pain is episodic and generally occurs in the mid to upper abdomen. If the obstruction is partial, the pain worsens right after the patient eats and improves with digestion. Distension and generalized discomfort without colicky pain may indicate a lack of movement in the intestines caused by paralysis of the bowel, paralytic ileus. Sometimes the patient gets pain relief after changing, position or vomiting, times vomiting, nausea and vomiting occur as a result of increased peristaltic activity, but the intestinal contents reverse the direction instead of moving forward. The vomiting is often projectile and non-fecal, especially if there is obstruction high in the small bowel. Another sign of obstruction high in the small intestine is vomit that is odorless or looks or smells like bile. A. Greenish-yellow fluid that has a bitter, offensive odor. Dot, constipation is a common sign of small bowel obstruction. However, in A. Partial obstruction, the patient may have diarrhea and pass some gas. In A. Complete obstruction, the patient may have a bowel movement if the obstruction is fell above the stool that's already in the bowel. Obstipation, complete obstruction. Dot, hyperactive high-pitched bowel sounds. The bowel sounds range from hyperactive bowel sounds, increased loudness, tone, and regularity, to totally absent bowel sounds, typical of a paralytic ileus, times palpable loops of bowel, times shock, oliguria and constant abdominal pain seen with late partial obstruction or strangulated bowel and or perforation. 2. Related to large bowel obstruction, milder symptoms with more gradual onset, times lower abdominal cramping, times occasional fecal type vomitus, times increasing constipation leads to obstipation with abdominal distension, times nausea and vomiting may be absent at first. As the large bowel obstruction, worsens, the patient's vomit may smell like feces, times bloating is more visible in patients with a large bowel obstruction, times palpable mass, times tympani with percussion, 
Epstein systemic symptoms are relatively mild and fluid and electrolyte deficits are uncommon. 2.2.5 Diagnostic Assessment Times when a patient has abdominal pain and complains of nausea and vomiting. It's critical that you begin your assessment by taking a complete and detailed history. Ask the patient about his bowel habits and find out about any surprising changes. Ask when he had his last bowel movement, any bloating of abdomen or constipation. Were there prior surgeries? Abdominal trauma, hernias? Peptic ulcer disease? Does the patient experience constipation or indigestion? Has he had gallstones? Tumors? Radiation therapy to the abdomen or the peritoneal area? Has he ever had an eating disorder? Find out about current and past medications. Times ask and determine the location, duration, intensity, frequency and the type of abdominal pain. Ask what, if anything, Release the pain. Times find out if he has nausea or vomiting, and, if so, with what frequency, consistency, color, amount and odor, and record the onset, frequency, amount, color, and odor. Record bowel function, any passage of flatus. Times once you obtain a thorough history, it's time to assess the patient. Times inspect the abdomen for any scar, abdominal mass and distension. Times measure the abdominal girth. Times monitor vital signs. If temperature is elevated, it could be a sign of infection or possible perforation. Tachycardia C, L.LLBA related to possible hypovolemic, shock or septicemia and when you measure blood pressure, keep in mind that hypotension is secondary to low circulating fluid volume. Times monitor hydration status, capillary refill time, BP, pulse skin turgor, urine, output, dot, Times assist bowel sounds including character and location. Auscultate to all four quadrants of the abdomen. You should be able to hear some bowel sounds at least once every 5 to 15 seconds. They might last one to a few seconds each. In a normal bowel, the sounds may be high-pitched gurgling sounds. If you don't detect bowel sounds, there may be a problem, such as paralytic, ileus or a bowel obstruction. Observe for muscle guarding and tenderness, high-pitched or tinkling sounds may correspond to a hyperactive bowel with increased peristalsis. They are associated with diarrhea and typically occur. Anterior to an obstruction, after initial assessment, a number of diagnostic tests are done to determine the location, extent, and severity of the obstruction. Help the patient physically and psychologically to undergo these diagnostic tests. These tests include following, times a complete blood cell, CBC, count to look for signs of infection and dehydration. An elevated white blood cell count, 15,000 to 20, 000 mm3, is a sign of infection and may indicate bowel strangulation or perforation. Times an increased hematocrit level may mean dehydration. Times serum electrolytes I, sodium, potassium, chlorides decreased, but increased. Time serum amylase levels may be elevated, particularly when strangulation is present. Time serum osmolality may increase. Times ABGs may reveal metabolic alkalosis, pH 7.45, bicarbonates 26 MEQL, PC 0 to 45 mmHg, with small bowel obstruction due to loss of HCI from the stomach. Times urinalysis urine specific gravity increases. Times type and cross match. If there's a chance the patient needs surgical intervention. Dot, times abdominal x rays. Flat and upright views to determine the location, pattern, and types. Mechanica 1 or non mechanical, partial or complete, of the obstruction. It shows distended loops of intestine with fluid and gas in a small bowel obstruction. Free air under diaphragm indicates a perforation. Times barium enema may be used to confirm the diagnosis of large bowel. Obstruction, times computed to ography can also determine the location and degree of the obstruction. It's about 90% sensitive and specific in diagnosing small bowel obstruction and is the preferred diagnostic imaging test.
times barium enema to determine the exact location and confirm the presence of an obstruction. Barium is used with great caution and not at all if a perforation is suspected. Dot. Times colonoscopy to help in the assessment and diagnosis of a large bowel obstruction times gastroscopy. Tests, which can indicate an upper gastrointestinal mass, 2.2.6 Therapeutic management, treatment of acute intestinal obstruction must proceed simultaneously with diagnosis, I, conservative medical management. Times nasogastric tube or intestinal tubes, Canto or Millerab bot tubes, may be used to decompress the bowel so as to relieve distension and nausea. Note, the color and amount of aspirate, times four fluids that contain normal saline and potassium to restore, balance, and or replace lost fluid. The types and amounts of fluids ordered depend on the results of lab tests and the overall condition of the patient. TPN may be necessary in some cases to correct the nutritional status, times four antibiotics if bowel ischemia is suspected and to minimize the risk of infection that may result from the contents of the intestine spilling into the peritoneal and abdominal cavities, times pain management. 2. Surgical treatment. The choice of surgical procedure depends on the type and location of the bowel, obstruction, surgery in the small bowel, it can be a resection with end-to-end -end anastomosis. In this procedure, the surgeon removes the diseased tissue and reattaches either end of the healthy intestinal tissue to the other. When surgery is chosen for a large bowel obstruction, the predominant cause of the obstruction is often a malignant tumor. If there's perforation or diverticular, the surgery may be a resection with anastomosis. If there's a tumor in the colon, a hemicolectomy, removal of the diseased part of the colon, may be appropriate. You should prepare the pateret physically and mentally for the type of surgery and the rehabilitation required in the postoperative period. If colostomy liliostomy is to be performed, psychological preparation of the patient and of significant others is required. You should actively participate in the rehabilitation of the patient and family members. 2.2.7 Nursing Management I. Nursing Assessment It should start with detailed health history and physical examination as discussed below. Times health history and physical exam till the time, complaints of abdominal pain, bloating, constipation, determine the location, duration, intensity and frequency of the abdominal pain. Record the onset, frequency, color, odor and amount of vomitus, bowel function. E. G. Passage of flatus should be recorded. Auscultate abdomen for bowel sounds, character and location. Inspect the abdomen for any scar, abdominal mass, distension. Observe for muscle guarding and tenderness, previous history of intestinal obstruction or risk factors such as hernia, diverticulosis, previous abdominal surgery, vital signs, temperature BP, skin color, texture and turgor, color and moisture of mucous membrane. 2. Times, 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 nursing diagnoses acute pain related to abdominal distension and increased peristalsis, reabsorption and loss of fluids secondary to vomiting, deficient fluid volume related to decrease in intestinal fluid, ineffective tissue perfusion related to severe reduction in the circulating, blood volume, ineffective breathing pattern related to abdominal distension, imbalanced nutrition related to intestinal obstruction and vomiting. 3. Planning your main goals are to decrease distension or remove gas and fluid, to relieve or remove obstruction, decompression, to maintain fluid and electrolyte balance, to improve nutritional status. 4. Nursing interventions, times monitor vital signs, blood pressure, pulse, respiration and temperature, dot, times oxygen inhalation to supply. Adequate oxygen to tissue organs, times intake and output record, Urine output and nasogastric aspirate. Note, the color and amount of aspirate. Times adequate hydration is very important to maintain renal function and tissue perfusion, tilde or prevent shock, and to maintain adequate blood pressure. Taking care of in lines and recording the amount and type of fluid administered. 
Times pain medications are useful to control pain and the patient's anxiety. Times if patient has abdominal distension, measure his abdominal girth every shift. Each time, make sure the patient is in the supine position if as he is comfortable and it is not contraindicated. Times use the same measuring tape, measure at the same time and mark the site on his abdomen to ensure accuracy. Times determine if his bowel function has improved by noting the absence of nausea and vomiting. Listen for bowel sounds and note any expulsion. Of flatters and stools, times examine the incision to check if there is drainage from the surgical wound. Times check if patient has an ostomy, a surgically created opening in the abdomen for the discharge of intestinal waste. A colostomy is created for problems associated with the blockage of the large intestine. An ileostomy is an opening created for problems in the small intestine. This is when your support, understanding, and ability to educate are an essential part of your patient care. Assess the stoma and ensure that the pouch protects the skin and contains drainage. Times observe the parastomal skin and prevent excoriation due to drainage coming in contact with the skin. The stoma may be closed afterwards, times comfort and reassure the patient. Teach him what to expect during his recovery period. Ensure to include the patient's family and caregivers in the plan of care when appropriate. Times explain the patient the purpose of any tubes and clarify the sequence of procedures to alleviate his anxiety. Times while patient can't take nutrition by mouth, provide good mouth care. Use a water-soluble lubricant for lip care and care of the nasal mucosa. If she he has an NG tube in place, provide the appropriate care for the tube as well as for the patient. When your patient is ready to eat, usually within 24 to 48 hours after surgery or at the first sounds of peristalsis, a progressive diet will be ordered as tolerated. Times provide comfort measures for relief of the patient as and when possible. Simply raising the head of the bed to 45 degrees helps the patient breathe better and can help create a more restful environment. Times prevent infection by maintaining aseptic technique and taking care of the patient's hygiene and of physical surroundings. One follow-up advice, teach the patient to recognize signs and symptoms of recurrent problems such as infection. Recurrence of obstruction, so that she he knows when to seek help from his health care provider. 2.3 Perforative peritonitis Perforative peritonitis is the most common surgical emergency in India. Despite advances in surgical techniques, antimicrobial therapy and intensive care support, management of peritonitis continues to be highly demanding, difficult and complex. Any part of the GI tract may become perforated from a variety of causes, releasing gastric or intestinal contents into the peritoneal space. Symptoms develop suddenly, with severe pain followed shortly by signs of shock. Peritonitis is life-threatening without prompt treatment. While working in the critical care unit, you should identify the patients with the signs and symptoms of perforative peritonitis to decrease morbidity and mortality in these patients. We shall discuss about definition etiological factors. Pathophysiology, clinical manifestations, diagnosis, therapeutic management and nursing management in following subsections 2.3.1 definition. Peritonitis is an inflammation, irritation of the peritoneum, the tissue that lines the wall of the abdomen and covers the abdominal organs. 2.3.2 Etiological eye, actors, sites and etiological factors of bowel perforations leading to peritonitis are times duodenum, the most common site of perforation in the bowel is duodenum, duodenal perforation, is a complication of untreated chronic duodenal ulcer and administration of NSAIDs. The duodenum gets perforated commonly on the anterior surface, Times stomach, either a peptic ulcer or carcinoma of stomach may get perforated. Administration of NSAIDs may contribute to perforations of stomach. Times small intestines, perforation of small intestines is due to typhoid fever and regional enteritis or as a complication of unrelieved intestinal obstructions.
times large intestines, the large bowel perforations are mainly due to malignancy, diverticulosis, and ulcerative colitis, and during medical procedures like colonoscopy, sigmoidoscopy, and biopsies. Times other appendages, intestinal appendages like vermiform appendix. Meckles, diverticulum or colonic diverticula may get inflamed and get perforated. Times other causes, or intestinal obstructions, strangulations may lead to perforations, or external penetrating injuries and injuries to intestines during laparoscopic. And surgical procedures may cause perforations of intestines, or ingestion of caustic substances, accidental or intentional ingestion of caustic substances may result in acute intestinal perforation and peritonitis. Delayed perforation may occur up to four days after acid exposure or foreign bodies. These may cause perforation of the esophagus, stomach or small intestine with intra-abdominal infection, peritonitis and sepsis. 2.3.3 Pathophysiology Normally, the stomach is relatively free of bacteria and other microorganisms because of its high intraluminal acidity. Most persons who experience abdominal trauma have normal gastric functions and are not at risk of bacterial contamination. Following gastric perforation However, those who have a pre-existing gastric problem are at risk of peritoneal contamination with gastric perforation. Leakage of acidic gastric juice into the peritoneal cavity often results in profound chemical peritonitis. If the leakage is not closed and food particles reach the peritoneal cavity, chemical peritonitis is succeeded by gradual development of bacterial peritonitis. Patients may be free of symptoms for several hours between the initial chemical peritonitis and the later occurrence of bacterial peritonitis. The microbiology of the small bowel changes from its proximal to its distal part. Few bacteria populate the proximal part of the small bowel. Whereas the distal part of the small bowel, the jejunum and ileum, contains aerobic organisms, example Escherichia coli, and a higher percentage of anaerobic organisms, example Bacteroids fragilis. Thus, the likelihood of intra-abdominal or wound infection is increased with perforation of the distal bowel, the presence of bacteria in the peritoneal cavity stimulates an influx of acute, inflammatory cells. The omentum and viscera tend to localize the site of inflammation, producing a phlegmin. This usually occurs in perforation of the large bowel. The resulting hypoxia in its area facilitates growth of anaerobes and produces impairment of bactericidal activity of granulocytes which leads to increased phagocytic activity of granulocytes, degradation of cells, hypertonicity, of fluid forming the abscess, osmotic effects, shift of more fluids into the abscess, area, and enlargement of the abdominal abscess. If untreated, bacteremia, generalized sepsis, multi-organ failure, and shock may occur. Our 2.3.4 clinical manifestations the main manifestations of peritonitis are acute abdominal pain, abdominal tenderness, and abdominal guarding, which are exacerbated by moving the peritoneum, example, cuffing, flexing the hips, or eliciting the Blumberg sign, i.e., rebound tenderness, meaning that pressing a hand on the abdomen elicits less pain than releasing the hand abruptly, which will aggravate the pain as the peritoneum snaps back into place. The presence of these signs in a patient is sometimes referred to as peritonism. Along with these patients will present with following signs and symptoms, times anorexia, nausea, vomiting, times abdominal distension, times weakness, pallor, excessive sweating, and cold skin because of excessive loss of fluid, electrolytes, and protein into the abdominal cavity, times hypotension, times tachycardia, times signs of dehydration, times temperature of 103 degrees Fahrenheit, 39.4 degrees C or higher, times abdominal distension and resulting upward displacement of the diaphragm may decrease respiratory capacity. Typically, the patient with peritonitis tends to breathe shallowly. 2.3.5 Diagnostic Assessment 
patient in severe pain will be very anxious. You should help the patient physically and psychologically to undergo various diagnostic evaluations, rectal and bimanual vaginal and pelvic examination. These examinations may help in assessing conditions such as acute appendicitis, ruptured tubovarian, abscess, and perforated acute diverticulitis, laboratory investigations, time CBC is done to determine leukocytosis greater than 20,000. Times parasynthesis is done and aspirate is sent for blood, by pus, bacteria, fungus, and amylase, times. Serum electrocytes are also measured. Other tests, times abdominal computed tomography scan or x-rays showing edematous and gaseous distension of the small and large bowel support the diagnosis. In the case of perforation of a visceral organ, the x-ray shows air in the abdominal cavity, times 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 chest x-ray may show elevation of the diaphragm, peritoneoscopy. This may be necessary to identify the underlying cause. It may be helpful in patients with outer sites, 2.3.6 therapeutic management. After peritonitis develops, emergency treatment must combat infection, restore intestinal motility, and replace fluids and electrolytes when peritonitis results from perforation. Surgery is necessary. The aim of surgery is to eliminate the source of infection by evacuating the spilled contents and repairing any organ perforation. Prevention of complications To prevent perforative peritonitis, steps should be taken for times early treatment of GI inflammatory conditions, times avoiding over-the-counter medications, times preoperative and postoperative antibiotic therapy after GI surgery prevents perforation and subsequent peritonitis, 2.3.7 Nursing Management, I, Nursing Assessment, History Taking and Physical Examination, Ask Patients About the Time of Onset of Pain, the Duration and Location of Pain, the Characteristics of Pain, Relieving and Aggravating Factors, and Other Symptoms Associated with Abdominal Pain, Times Sharp, Severe, Sudden onset epigastric pain that awakens the patient from sleep often suggests perforated peptic ulcer. Differentiate this from conditions such as cholecystitis and pancreatitis. Times painless perforation of a peptic ulcer can occur with steroid use. Times the presence of shoulder pain suggests involvement of the parietal peritoneum of the diaphragm. Times in elderly patients, consider the possibility of perforated diverticulitis or Ruptured acute appendicitis if the pain is located in the lower abdomen. In young adults with pain in the lower abdominal quadrant, consider perforated appendicitis as a possible diagnosis. Acute appendicitis with sudden perforation is usually associated with illness of several hours. The pain is typically localized in the right lower quadrant of the abdomen. Unless the disease process has progressed to generalized peritonitis. Times in young women also consider ruptured ovarian cyst and ruptured tubovarian abscess in the differential diagnosis. Times, times assess for signs of impending shock eye, low BP, tachycardia, and pale skin. Times take vital signs and assess for any hemodynamic changes. Times take pulse and blood pressure measurements with the patient lying in bed and sitting, and note any postural changes, abdominal examination, times examine the abdomen for any external signs of injury, abrasion, and or ecchymosis. Observe patient's breathing patterns and abdominal movements with breathing, and note any abdominal distension or discoloration. In perforated peptic ulcer disease, patients lie immobile, occasionally with knees, flexed, and the abdomen is described as bored lake. Times bowel sounds are usually absent in generalized peritonitis. Times carefully palpate the entire abdomen, noting any masses or tenderness, tachycardia, fever, and generalized abdominal tenderness may suggest peritonitis. Abdominal fullness and doughy consistency may indicate intraabdominal hemorrhage. Times tenderness on percussion may suggest peritoneal inflammation. 2. Nursing diagnoses, times abdominal pain related to perforation and inflammation of the peritoneum.
times risk for fluid volume deficit related to collection of fluid in the peritoneum. Nausea and vomiting times altered nutrition related to perforation of GI tract. Nausea and vomiting times anxiety related to pain, uncertainty of cause and outcome times potential complications, hypovolemic and septic shock. 3. Planning times resolution of inflammation times relief of abdominal pain times prevention of complications times improvement in nutritional status. 4. Implementation The patient with peritonitis is acutely ill, needs intensive nursing care times assist pain times analgesic as prescribed for pain management times position the patient in a comfortable position, times maintain airway, breathing and respiration, times oxic tilde and inhalation for adequate tissue perfusion, times monitor vital signs i, blood pressure, pulse, respiration and temperature, times NPO and nasogastric, NG, aspiration and recording the amount and color of aspirate, times accurate monitoring of fluid intake and output times total parenteral nutrition to meet the nutritional requirements, times urinary catheterization is used to assist urinary flow and fluid replacement, times measuring abdominal girth and recording, times administer systemic antibiotics as prescribed, preoperative nursing management, times pain. Management, times to decrease peristalsis the patient should receive nothing by mouth, times LV. Fluids are administered, Times nasogastric, NG, suction should be done, times antibiotic therapy should be given as advised usually. It includes the administration of appropriate antibiotics, depending on the infecting organisms, times preparing patient for the surgery, post-operative nursing management, times patient is managed for airway, breathing and respiration, times administering parenteral fluids and electrolytes as ordered and accurately. Recording fluid intake and urine output, including drainage from the NG, tube and the incision. Times placing the patient in semi-fowler's position to promote drainage through drainage tube. By gravity, times encouraging the patient to deep read, cough effectively, and use an incentive spirometer. Times teaching the patient how to splint the incision. Observe and record character. Of drainage from postoperative wound drains if inserted, take care to avoid dislodging drains, times regular cleaning and lubrication of oral cavity to counteract dryness due to NG intubation, times encouraging and assisting in ambulation as ordered, usually on the first postoperative day, times observing for signs of dehiscence, may complain that something gave way, an abscess formation, persistent abdominal tenderness and fever. Dot. Times frequently assessing for peristaltic tildativity by listening. For bowel sounds and evaluating for passage of flatus, bowel movements, and soft abdomen, times when peristalsis returns and temperature and pulse rate are normal or when NG output diminishes less than 200 milliliters per 24 hours. The NG tube is removed, times gradually decreasing parenteral fluids and increasing oral intake. Times postoperatively, preparing patient and family for discharge, teaching them how to care of incision and drains if still in place at discharge, 2.4 intra abdominal compartment syndrome, abdominal compartment syndrome, ACS, is a manifestation of severe intraabdominal hypertension and is characterized by an acute rise in intraabdominal pressure that results in impaired intraabdominal organ. Perfusion The patient Presence massive abdominal distension with attendant cardiovascular, respiratory, and renal insufficiency. It occurs when a fixed compartment, defined by myofascial, elements or bone, becomes subject to increased pressure, leading to ischemia and organ dysfunction. Well recognized to occur in the extremities, it also occurs in the abdomen, and some believe in the intracranial cavity. Abdominal compartment syndrome is probably under-recognized because it primarily affects patients who are already quite ill and whose organ dysfunction may be incorrectly ascribed to progression of the primary illness. Untreated, ACS has a high mortality rate since treatment can improve organ dysfunction.
it is important that the diagnosis be considered in the appropriate clinical situation. You being working in the critical care units can identify the impending signs and symptoms of abdominal compartment syndrome and can prevent the life threatening complications in the patients. Times 2.4.1 Definition Organ dysfunction caused by intraabdominal hypertension, IH, is considered to be abdominal compartment syndrome. The dysfunction may be respiratory, insufficiency secondary to compromised tidal volumes, decreased urine output caused by falling renal perfusion, or any organ dysfunction caused by increased abdominal compartment pressure. Intraabdominal pressure is a steady state pressure concealed within the abdominal cavity. For most critically ill patients, an intraabdominal pressure of 5 to 7 mmHg is considered normal and is directly related to body mass index. Patients with increased abdominal girth that developed slowly may have higher baseline intraabdominal pressures. As an example, morbidly obese and pregnant, individuals can have chronically intraabdominal pressure as high as 10 to 15 mmHg without adverse sequelae. The morbidity of abdominal compartment syndrome is attributed to its effects on multiple organ systems. Because of this, abdominal compartment syndrome has a high mortality rate even with treatment. Furthermore, abdominal compartment syndrome is often a sequelae to severe injuries that independently carry high morbidity and mortality rates. 2.4 point to classification of abdominal compartment syndrome, ACS. Intraabdominal hypertension, IH, is a sustained intraabdominal pressure is equal to 12. MMHG which can be further classified as times hyperacute IHI, elevation of the intraabdominal pressure lasting only seconds. It is due to laughing, coughing, straining, sneezing, defecation, or physical activity times acute ICHI, elevation of the intraabdominal pressure that develops over hours. It is usually the result of trauma or intraabdominal hemorrhage and can lead to the rapid development of ACS. Time subacute IHI, elevation of the intraabdominal pressure that develops over days. It is most common in medical patients and can also lead to ACS. Times chronic IHI, elevation of intraabdominal pressure that develops over months, pregnancy, or years, morbid obesity. It does not cause ACS, but does place the individual at higher risk for ACS if they develop superimposed, acute or subacute IH. Abdominal compartment syndrome is organ dysfunction caused by intraabdominal hypertension, IH, and can be divided into the following three categories, times primary or acute abdominal compartment syndrome. This occurs when Intraabdominal pathology is directly and p. Oximally responsible for the compartment syndrome times secondary abdominal compartment syndrome. This occurs when no visible intraabdominal injury is present but injuries outside the abdomen cause fluid accumulation times chronic abdominal compartment syndrome. This occurs in the presence of cirrhosis and ascites, often in the eight stages of the disease. Conditions like severe adenamic ileus, bowel obstruction, retroperitoneum, hematoma, necrotizing pancreatitis, hemoperitoneum, hepatic ascites et may cause to intraabdominal hypertension, leading to ACS. Now you know that intraabdominal hypertension, IAR, and abdominal compartment syndrome, ACS, are distinct clinical entities and should not be used interchangeably. Elevated pressure in the abdomen is referred to as intraabdominal hypertension, IAR, while the end-stage organ failure that occurs due to the pathophysiologic derangements that resulted by increased intraabdominal pressure, referred as the abdominal compartment syndrome, ACS. 2.4.3 Etiological factors The three types of abdominal compartment syndrome have different and sometimes overlapping causes. I. Primary or acute ACS, times penetrating trauma, times intraperitoneal hemorrhage, times pancreatitis, times external compressing forces, such as debris from a motor vehicle, collision or after a large structure explosion, 
times pelvic fracture, times rupture of abdominal aortic aneurysm, times perforated peptic ulcer. 2. Secondary Secondary ACS may occur in patients without an intra. Abdominal injury When fluid accumulates in volume sufficient to cause IH dot, times large volume resuscitation, times large areas of full thickness burns may lead to ACS within 24 hours if they receive average of 237 milliliters per kilogram over a 12-hour period, times penetrating or blunt trauma without identifiable injury, times postoperative, times packing and primary facial closure, which increases incidence, times sepsis, 2. Chronic, times peritoneal dialysis, times morbid obesity, times cirrhosis, 2.4.4 pathophysiology. Normal intraabdominal pressure is less than 10 mm Hg. The abdominal cavity, that includes peritoneal and, to a lesser extent, retroperitoneal cavities, are much more distensible than an extremity. They reach an endpoint at which the pressure rises dramatically due to intraabdominal hemorrhage, surgical packing, or third, space fluids may cause a rise in the intraabdominal pressure. Fig.2.2 Pathophysiology changes in intra-abdominal compartment syndrome, the increase in pressure within the abdomen has both direct and indirect on organ perfusion. It causes progressive hypoperfusion and ischemia of the intestines and other peritoneal and retroperitoneal structures. In the kidney, there may be direct compression of the renal artery or vein resulting in partho, physiological effects including release of cytokines, formation of oxygen-free radicals, and decreased cellular production of adenosine triphosphate. These processes may lead to translocation of bacteria from the gut and intestinal edema, predisposing patients to multi-organ dysfunction syndrome. As pressure rises, abdominal compartment syndrome impairs not only visceral organs but also the cardiovascular and the pulmonary systems, it may also cause a decrease in cerebral perfusion pressure. Daughter, I. Abdominal compartment syndrome follows a destructive pathway similar to compartment syndrome of the extremity. Problems begin at the organ level with direct compression. Hollow systems such as the intestinal tract and portal cavil system collapse under high pressure. Immediate effects such as thrombosis or bowel wall edema are followed by translocation of bacterial products leading to additional fluid accumulation, further increasing intraabdominal pressure. At the cellular level, oxygen delivery is impaired leading to ischemia and anaerobic metabolism. Vasoactive substances such as histamine and serotonin increase endothelial permeability, further capillary leakage impairs red cell transport, and ischemia, see fig.2.2.2.2.5 clinical manifestations, Clinical manifestations of ACS are not only seen in the abdominal cavity, but are evident in all organ systems of the body. The pulmonary, cardiovascular, renal, gastrointestinal, neurological, and immune systems can all exhibit signs of dysfunction when IHEAX develops. I. Pulmonary manifestations, increased lap creates a restrictive effect on the lungs. The restrictive effect on the lung leads to reduced ventilation. Decreased lung compliance, increase in airway pressures, and reduction in tidal volumes, the end result being respiratory acidosis. 2. Cardiovascular manifestations, increased lap reduces cardiac output, increases central venous pressure, increases systemic vascular resistance, increases pulmonary artery pressure, and pulmonary artery wedge pressure. The rises in pressures can be misleading as the rises in pressures are not necessarily due to increased volume. Ill renal manifestations, increased lap can cause reduction in renal plasma flow and glomerular filtration rate. Most likely this is due to increase in renal vascular resistance and decreases in cardiac output, leading to oliguria. 4. Gastrointestinal manifestations, lap decreases abdominal perfusion pressure decreases celiac blood flow, decreases superior mesenteric artery blood flow, decreases the blood flow to all intraabdominal organs, 
and decreases mucosal blood flow. Enteral feeding becomes difficult, intestinal permeability increases and bacterial translocation can occur. There is an increased risk for gastrointestinal bleeding. V. Neurological manifestations Increased lap can cause obstruction of cerebral venous outflow, leading to vascular congestion and increased intracranial pressure. Decreased cardiac output in combination with increased intracranial pressure lead to decreased cerebral perfusion pressure. 2.4.6 Diagnostic Assessments Patients with following history and clinical parameters should be confirmed for the diagnosis of IHEAX by IAP. History times increase in abdominal girth, times difficulty in breathing, times decreased urine output, times syncope, times malena, dot, times non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, NSAID, use, times alcohol abuse, times nausea and vomiting, times history of pancreatitis, clinical parameters, times distended, tense abdomen, times lap 20 mm of Hg, times elevated peak, airway pressure, times massive IV fluids requirements, times renal insufficiency, oliguria to anuria, not responding to volume repletion, times decreased or diminished cardiac output. With high filling pressure, times hypoxemia refractory to increase Fi02 and PEEP, times hypercarbia, times hypercapnia, times wide pulse pressure, times acidosis, intra-abdominal pressure, lap. Intra-abdominal pressure is helpful to decide the severity of the condition and the need for decompression. Measurement is mostly accomplished through transvesical pressure measurements. Other methods are rectal route measurement, direct intraperitoneal measurement, and intragastric method via a nasogastric tube. Dot, a direct intraperitoneal measurement using a peritoneal dialysis catheter. Direct measurement via a peritoneal dialysis catheter is the most accurate measurement but is not a realistic method for the majority of ICU patients. Since it is invasive and involves the insertion of an intertilde peritoneal catheter into the abdomen, b. Measurement via urinary catheter in the bladder. Lap measurement is mostly accomplished through this method. The goal Standard measurement in the ICU has been the urinary catheter connected to a pressure transducer monitoring set in order to get a bladder pressure measurement. Bladder pressure measurement is reflective of lap and is measured in millimeters of mercury, mmHg, dot, indications for lap monitoring, times postoperative abdominal surgery patients, times patients with open or blunt abdominal trauma times mechanically ventilated patients with other organ dysfunction, times patients with symptoms and signs consistent with ACS including oliguria, increased ventilatory requirements and unexplained acidosis, times patients with bums and massive fluid resuscitation. Method 100 ml of sterile saline is instilled into the bladder via the aspiration port of the Foley's catheter with the drainage tube clamped. And is gauge needle attached to. A pressure transducer is then inserted in the aspiration port and the pressure is measured. The transducer should be zeroed at the level of the symphysis pubic. 2.4.7 Therapeutic management. The best way to treat ACS is to prevent it. Recognizing early signs and symptoms is the best form of treatment for ACS. I. Non surgical options for management and treatment of IH and ACS focus on reducing lap. A. Improve up till the ominal wall compliance by using sedation and analgesia to reduce muscle tone, reducing abdominal muscle tone by initiating neuromuscular blockade and keeping the head of bed in the lowest position possible. B. Evacuating intraluminal contents by performing nasogastric decompression rectal decompression or NMRs or administration of prokinetic motility agents, c. evacuating abdominal fluid collections via upper cutaneous decompression, d. correcting positive fluid balance with fluid restriction, diuretics and colloids to mobilize the third space edema or intermittent or continuous hemodialysis ultra. Filtration to remove fluids. 2. Surgical decompression is a life-saving intervention when IH is refractory 
to all other treatments and organ dysfunction is present. When surgical decompression is done the abdomen is left open and must be closed with a dressing. Temporary abdominal closure techniques are used to cover the abdomen until the condition subsides and definitive closure of the patient's abdomen is completed with either a skin graft or flap. Negative pressure, wound therapy or iodine impregnated plastic adhesive drape are two types of temporary abdominal closures that may be used. 2.4.8 Nursing Management Nursing care involves vigilant monitoring for early detection, including serial measurements of intra-abdominal pressure, intra-abdominal hypertension and ACS occur in many ICU settings, PICD, MICU, and SICU. Therefore, as a nurse, working in these areas you should monitor and report any changes in the patient's condition, times vital signs IEBP, pulse, respiration, times increase in tenseness of abdominal wall, times increase abdominal girth, times change in urine output, oliguria or anuria, times change in intra-abdominal pressure, times changes in level of consciousness, elevated intracranial pressure, times hypoxia and hypercarbia, times FI0 to changes in vision, dot nursing care of the patient who has ear wax, times maintaining a patent airway, times frequent abdominal assessments i, abdominal girth, intra-abdominal pressure, times blood pressure monitoring, times heart rate monitoring, times pulse oximetry monitoring, times monitoring of respiratory rate, times hemodynamic monitoring, i, central venous pressure, pulmonary artery, pressures, and cardiac output, times fluid intake and urine output, times electrolyte balance, times maximal positioning for lower IAP, usually head of bed in the lowest position. 2.5 Summary In this unit we discussed about acute intestinal obstruction, perforative peritonitis, and abdominal compartment syndrome conditions. Intestinal obstruction exists when blockage prevents the normal flow of intestinal contents through the intestinal tract. The obstruction can be partial or complete. Its severity depends on the region of bowel affected, the degree to which the lumen is occluded, and especially the degree to which the vascular supply to the bowel is compromised. In perforative peritonitis, any part of the 0-1 tract may become perforated from a variety of causes, releasing gastric or intestinal contents into the peritoneal space, symptoms develop suddenly, with severe pain followed shortly by signs of shock. Diagnosis is usually made by the presence of free air in the abdomen on imaging studies. Treatment is with fluid resuscitation, antibiotics, and surgery. Mortality is high, varying with the underlying disorder and the patient's general health. Abdominal compartment syndrome is a potentially lethal condition caused by any event that produces intraabdominal hypertension, normal intraabdominal. Pressure is 0 to 5 mm Hg. Physiologic compromise begins when the pressure rises. Above 8 to 10 mm Hg. Once the pressures increase beyond about 20 mm Hg, irreversible tissue injury occurs, ultimately resulting in ACS and multiple organ failure. Early recognition of rising abdominal pressure is critically important because it allows prompt intervention which will prevent ACS from developing, thereby leading to a much better prognosis for the patient. Thank you. Subscribe to our channel for more updates, and we will see you with the next chapter.